Hey, this is Brandon Christensen, the director and co-writer of Z. Uh, I actually wanted to start off first by saying that this opening shot of a hand carrying an airplane is actually my hand. Uh, Jet Klein's hands, or his arms, sorry, weren't long enough to to reach this far with the lenses that we had. So right here, boom, that's my hand. Uh, this whole opening sequence we actually shot months later at my house because... Uh, we weren't able to shoot this whole sequence when we were actually, you know, in principal photography. Um, so it was kind of uh, fun just to have Jet come out and film for a couple of days as we did some pickups, including this sequence. But the one funny thing is uh, he had super long hair. He hadn't cut it, cut it after, uh, after we had shot Z, so he had this really long kind of hockey boy hair. And uh, we knew about this, so we, we set up an appointment at a, uh, a local barber. I won't say which uh, place, but it's a, a national franchise. And I brought a photo of the, the sequence at the end when the mom, Beth, calls for him. And I was like, match this, just match this. And the, the hairdresser said, okay, okay. And so I looked away for half a second, and they had basically cut off his entire bangs and everything. So we... It was a total scramble. I had to freak out and run out of the, the place. I won't say what it was, but, uh, you know, Jet wasn't very happy because he looked like Lloyd Christmas from Dumb and Dumber. And uh, we had, you know, I'd flown him out to shoot this, this, these few sequences. So luckily my wife, uh, her mom's a hairdresser, and she has, uh, uh, she has um, wigs that we have, and there's a Bobby-type wig that we were able to um, put on his head and Bobby pin the hell out of it so that... Uh, he, he had somewhat of normal hair. So if you look at some of the shots in that opening sequence, you can actually see that. Um, it was uh, stressful, but it ended up being a funny story. Um, this movie was kind of shot in two, uh, two halves because we had this the Parsons house here that we shot for the first two weeks of production. And uh, the entire two weeks were overnight. So we'd go from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day. And, you know, launching right into that when you start production is really tough, especially on day one, because you wake up at a normal time. Um, you you had to set at, you know, four or five thirty, uh, four or five o'clock in the, uh, at night. And it's sort of like as your day is ending, you're starting your 12 hour journey into the beginning of a feature film. So it's always very challenging to, um, you know, to start a film like that. So we had two straight weeks and everybody had to kind of just hold on tight as we uh as we went for um you know went for a four week production on this film um this was fun being able to shoot with a bunch of kids uh, some of the kids are in there actually my nephews but we just had an open cast and call on facebook and let people bring out their kids for a few hours as we shot uh, it's always cool to get outside of the house because this movie is very much a house movie just like my last film stillborn um you're pretty much just in living rooms and bedrooms for, you know, hours on end. So it's nice to get into a bigger space to give it a, to open up the scope of the film a little bit. Um, and this was really fun just to, to film with all these kids and, you know, create a class, classroom setting. So the Parson family, everything is so normal for them right now. They have no idea. This film in the background that they're watching right now is uh, Colin Minahan's What Keeps You Alive. So you get a small glimpse of the last film Digital Interference made. Um, and then the parents, you know, they start to hear something upstairs and, you know, everything's about to change for them. But, uh... This was really fun. Just shooting with, with Jet. And uh, these these back to back and forth the reverse here they were shot like two weeks apart we shot Beth's side on the first or second day of principal photography and then Jet's side was um you know the following week when we had him so it was it's always interesting because and it always leads to some issues when you start scheduling half of scenes for uh for one actor because you don't have the other one and then you you plan on returning and sometimes uh, it can get lost in the shuffle like it, it did on this. And I'll explain that a little bit later, what happened with one particular scene. But uh, good old Machi, that's the same stuffed animal that my older son has. And uh, Jet and I had to have an argument about how to pronounce his name because 
you know, I wrote it, and it, I wrote it as Machi, and he has a monkey that he calls Mochi, and uh, he was not happy about changing the name. Actors can be pretty stubborn sometimes. So this was fun. We had two days with Chandra, and she came out with us, and, you know, she was able to do these two quick scenes, and then the big scene later on with the, uh, the banister, that was, uh, that was a crazy experience. And this is now, we're jumping away from the house and we're going to week four of production when we had Deborah here playing the mom. And she was great. She was a lot of fun to work with. Uh, she was a local actor from Calgary. And uh, yeah, she came and it was fun to just play with her and let her sort of create this uh, this relationship with Beth here that, you know, they there's something going on in their past and they are not talking about it. They're kind of avoiding it and... Even though she's the only one visiting her mom here, she's not the one that she wants to see. And this little moment where um, she grabs her hand and she pulls it away, thats that was improvised on the day by them. They just sort of created that. And it's kind of a cool moment where you don't have them saying anything. You just sort of see it in in the reactions to to how these performers are working. It was pretty fun. So this house here that we're shooting at, that, that uh, played the mom's house, it's actually the same house that we used in Stillborn when uh, Mary reads about the other woman on the internet and she finds out about another woman that claims a baby uh, a demon stole her baby. Uh, we had shot there for a day on Stillborn and when we were looking for you know a similar old style house that was film friendly, um, we hit them up and they were lucky. Or they, they let us shoot there for, I think, six days, which was really fun, just because that house is, you know, it's it's just wall-to-wall -wall set decoration. It's got wallpaper and crazy colors and textures everywhere. It's so much fun to shoot in. Um, it's total far cry from this house, which is very nice and, and modern. Very sparsely decorated. A lot of that on purpose, just to, to keep it... Uh, you know, to keep it like she doesn't think about her past much. This scene here, this pizza scene, is, in my opinion, the worst scene in the film. Just the way uh, everything about it. This was on, on the 10th day of production, and this was the same day that we were shooting the big fire sequence. We had this scene, the second dinner scene later on, where we see it from Z's point of view, and then we had the big fire sequence. And so um, I think our call time was just a little too early because the sun was still was still out at six in Calgary. The summer sun, uh, stays out till like 10. So we were shooting this probably around 8 PM. And, uh, uh, this shot here, actually we shot at my house, uh, on second unit, you know, months later when we shot the, 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 uh, the extra opening. But, uh, yeah, the scene is just, it's just very, uh, this is my one big fail. And every time I, I won't watch it because of this scene. So it's always, uh, fun to revisit this sequence and, and see where your failings are. But just the coverage on it is very standard when it should have been really cinematic and really forcing Z into the middle of the frame there like we do later with the, the wallpaper or the, the charcoal on the wall reveal. Um, this is always fun. And this is actually an idea that we had early on and we were going to pay it off in a different way later. We do pay it off at the end of the film, but um, when... Colin Minahan and I were writing later drafts of the script. Uh, we had talked about potentially showing the imagination, like uh, when Beth kind of uh, goes to the other side of her imagination and showing the lava and doing all that stuff. But then we realized, like, oh, no, we don't have any money. We can't do anything like that. That's, that's insane. So we just kept it simple both times, and that's what we have. classic night-night scene. This was this whole thing, the good night, mom, good night, dad. That's something that we did with our kids, except we, we did I love you, mom, I love you, dad, I love you. Uh, they would say, or my, my sons would say their, each other's names, and they would say the, everyone in Canada, where our family is. They would say they love the dogs that we have and, and all this stuff, and so that was something that's always fun to kind of take things from your own life and apply a creepier twist to it so all these bedtime routines that you have with your own kids it just becomes something that you don't want to do anymore and we have since stopped i don't know if that's because of this film or just because of lazy parenting but uh we don't do it as much anymore i 
You always have the brushing your teeth scene. It's funny because you're you're always trying to just give the actor something to do when they're at their house, and it's like, what do you do at your house? There's brushing your hair, brushing your teeth, sitting on a phone. Uh, you know, you're not terribly active when you're at your house, so you got to give them something. And uh, you know, everyone gets ready for bed, and they should be brushing their teeth before bed. So here's Jet. There's some green screen. Car green screen, that's always fun. Luckily it's not showy enough to really make you realize that it's that. There's not many kids walking up to that school. So the sequence coming up here with the eyes. <clears throat> We had actually had a payoff sequence later in the film that we wrote and shot half of. Um, so we, we have this, you know, the initial version where she sees the eyes and then it turns out to be a toy. Um, there was a sequence cut from the film later where she is asked to play hide and seek with her kid. And uh, when she goes and looks for Josh, she is unable to find him anywhere and she's getting really upset with him because... She's just not into playing with him that much, and she just wants to end the game so she can just uh, finish up whatever she was doing before. But uh, when the door closes, she, she goes, and it's, it's very similar to the sequence where she walks up, she turns on the light, or she, the, it's, it's dark in the closet, and she can see eyes on there, uh, uh, you know, in the closet. And then she looks over, and she sees the truck, or the train toys, on, on the, uh, the bookshelf there. And she's thinking, well, what does that mean? Uh, and so she eventually turned on the light, and we were going to have a Z reveal right in her face there, and it was going to be a big jump scare, and she falls back, and Josh goes, hey, you found him. And it kind of led right into the scene at the play zone, which, you know, happens, uh, it happened pretty much right after, and it's a very similar scare. So even though, um, even though we shot that, uh, we only shot half of it because it was that situation earlier I was talking about where... Um, we didn't have Jet when we shot the first half, but we had to shoot stuff with Keegan alone, so we shot her half, and then we planned to shoot the other side, like the reverse of the whole scene, but somehow it just slipped through the cracks, and the, wasn't added to the call sheet, or it just, you know, was forgotten, and so when I was editing the film, it just turned into a situation where I'm cutting, I'm cutting it, I'm cutting it, and then all of a sudden I go, wait, where's the reverse on this? And then I search everywhere, and I, I start looking at call sheets and trying to figure out what we shot, and, uh, yeah, we just didn't shoot it. So we're missing a big kind of a scare sequence because of that. But I think ultimately it works for the film. So that sequence when she was talking to the teacher was interesting because we, we had, you know, half almost a whole day at that school. And we really kind of dove in on that scene with, with the teacher. And we had a lot more coverage. And one thing that was cut from the film is there was the stereotypical kids' creepy drawings, which was cut from the film, I guess, uh, no one really seemed, it didn't seem to land for anyone. It just seemed like very, uh, uh, kind of tried and true stuff that we didn't really need because everybody else has done it. So, and you're never going to beat the Babadook. So, uh, yeah, we ended up cutting it and just leaving it to just the, you know, the hitting kids and all that stuff. So here we have, uh, we're actually at my aunt's house here, just outside of Calgary. Uh, luckily they have a super nice house and they were willing to let us shoot in there because we needed that the uh the brown leather kind of office space that that feels you know very very much like you think when you think of a psychiatrist and this is this whole sequence about Josh playing with the board game there that was based off of my own childhood when I had some anxiety issues about going to school and I had to go see a psychologist and uh, they do that game I guess to try and relax you from thinking about your problems so you'll be a bit more open to talk so I think that was uh I think that's what they're doing anyways and so it had that you know I wrote that into there just to to sort of allude to that that experience I had when I was 10 no invisible friends for me though everything was I don't know it was all very strange this was fun Steve McCaddy's face is incredibly cinematic you just point a light at him and point a camera at him, and it's just like, I don't know, there's this, there's something behind those eyes that you see, and it's, it's very, uh, it's very interesting, it just gives you this very creepy vibe, it's great. Doesn't seem like Beth remembers much here, unfortunately, for her, but he does, something strikes a chord there. 
So this was Sarah's last scene that we shot. Um, it was on the sixth day of the third week, and we were shooting this shot here when thunder strikes, and it was basically seconds after this. We only were able to get one take of it because we went for this wide and lightning hits and thunder goes and it starts pouring and we just had to stop mid-take. And it was a bummer because it's such a nice shot. Um, so I could only use just the beginning of what we use, uh, uh, of what's here, basically, where that ends. Uh, the very next frame, the camera kind of wiggles as everyone jumps from this crazy close thunder. But that was fun, getting Jet to just sort of play in the foreground, and we had him ADR all these just random play lines and stuff. It was it was lots of fun. So there was actually a bunch of um, these sequences at night that didn't end up making the film. Um, there was a whole thing about the door handle in her room. Like right there, she's sitting up looking at the door handle, but uh, we ended up cutting it. It just wasn't very scary. So it happened in two pieces as well. Earlier on in the film, the very first night. Um, she wakes up to the door handle in her bedroom, just going down, down, down. And then she walks up, opens it up, and Josh was standing out there with blood all over his face because he had a really bad bleeding nose. And that was something that actually happened to my middle son, Max. He he um, woke us up screaming in the middle of the night, and we went in, and his face was just covered in blood. And it was like, whoa, what's going on? Turned out he just had a really bad bloody nose. And so that was put into the script as sort of a thing like, you know, if this imaginary friend is latching on, maybe it's giving him um, something, some maybe a new wrinkle in his brain or something like that that's causing his nose to bleed. So we just took part of the footage of that and kind of recombined it into this sequence that uh, ends up playing out like it was. But this is funny here because initially in the first cut and in the footage that we shot, when she does this reveal, Josh had his back turned to camera and he was cutting the sandwich and you could just sort of you know, creepy kid with a knife in the background, and I guess it wasn't, you know, it felt like it wasn't uh, scary enough, so we took a frame of him of him later, and uh, it's kind of a VFX shot to make it look like he's looking already at Beth when the, the fridge door open, or closes. And this was another thing that changed in post, too, is when she puts the sandwich down, Originally, the sandwich was completely gone, but because, uh, you know, just prior to this, it says he doesn't like the crust, we decided that in post we would just leave the crust. So it's uh, it's kind of funny. You always change those little things. And this sequence here was going to be initially she's having this morning, she sees the bowls and everything, and then she was going to look in the garbage and see the sandwich that was no longer on the plate. But since... Uh, since we changed that, it turned into a situation where we we no longer had, um, we no longer had that you know sandwich in the thing, and we uh, we just ended on the beat of her looking at the two bowls, which I think is great because right after this he leaves, she's looking at that, she's like, oh, what's going on with that sandwich, and then she goes and checks, and it was fine. So this here was just a the nightmare of the shoot. This was the third week, the sixth day, which we had to do because of certain scheduling things. But uh, we couldn't go in there until after they closed, which was around 9.30 or 10 p.m. And so we were going into this huge lighting setup, which was, I, I don't know, maybe a three-hour lighting setup to get this base look, because this just looks like a McDonald's play place normally. Um, but Brad, our DP, he did a great job with the team, just like bringing all this moving lights and neon lights and crazy 80s kind of uh, just insane lights and everything so it took took a long time to get going um so when we actually were able to shoot it was already one o'clock or something like that and so it's jet's last day of production he's um you know he's uh he was eight at the time so he's he's gonna get tired pretty easily once you hit that you know midnight hour and we're asking him to start filming pretty much around one so at this whole sequence, when we're up in, you know, up in this this thing, this isn't a set. This is me, Brad, the DP, and then uh, Tommy, our key grip, with the two actors up there with the camera. No monitor, nothing like that. Just doing the scene, watching off the little camera monitor, and just hoping for the best. And everybody was kind of just watching from below, like we were, like we were animals. And it was just like, oh man, it was such a terrible feeling, just so claustrophobic. This whole sequence was fun. This is when we shot immediately after that terrible pizza scene. The lighting had been so much better because it was actually darker now, so it actually you know feels like a movie instead of whatever that other scene was. But uh, it was kind of fun. I tried to do this in, in a one-er, 
and we did get it eventually. It took like 16 or 17 takes. Um, we had to, we basically did this scene until lunch and then the, the, the rest of the day was, you know, from like 12 till six was all the fire sequence, which I'll talk about later. But, um, uh, yeah, we did it all as a one and that was kind of how I wanted it to play. The whole scene was just going to play from Z's perspective, but it kind of lagged a little bit. And so luckily before we broke the scene, I, I, sh we shot some coverage, uh, which just sort of speeds up the edit a little bit. <clears throat> So this next, next sequence here is really funny. It's a very simple scene. You have uh, Keegan walking in. She's got sort of something on her mind, and then she comes up and tells him. But we did the initial blocking for it, and none of us could agree on how it should go. And it's it's funny because it's just like saying hi, taking a step in when you kind of want to get close to him and tell him the secret of yours. And uh, it just turned into the situation where we spent, I think, like 45 minutes trying to figure out the blocking. And you're in this tiny room. It's probably like an eight by eight square little office. And, uh, you know, everybody's just watching you and you're having this conversation, which is very circular. And you're just figuring out this, this, what this scene is going to look like. And it's, it's, you know, in hindsight and watching the edit, you're just like, oh, it's, you know, two people talking. You've got a couple over the shoulders and then you're out of it. And, uh, it's really funny that it, it took this long, but uh, it's so fun to watch Sean go so dark here. He just dials in this performance where you really buy into it. It's such it's so funny because it becomes a it becomes a, a trailer moment and everything. It's just like, oh man, this this movie's dramatic. Then you watch the film and it totally flips on itself. This is the problem with house movies is you, you you need to use the house and you need to use all the spaces in the house and you end up in a situation like this where you're just trying to make the best use of all these rooms that you're using and it just turns into a nightmare as you're just like you'll spend you know when you're in the bedroom you're not just shooting the one scene in the bedroom you're shooting all the scenes in the bedroom so you're just like okay, well, we're shooting this one side now. Let's do wardrobe changes because it's faster to change wardrobe than it is to relight and just kind of keep flipping the scene. So you end up going, how much, how many different scenes can I shoot from this one side before we do the reverse and we get all that stuff? And inevitably, you're just kind of jumping from scene to scene and, you know, you're going through these emotional arcs of these characters and it's it's so, so agonizing. Well, I'm sure as a performer, it's awful because you're kind of expected to act a certain way and then jump forward, act a certain way and then jump backwards and redo the way you had it before, even though you've kind of configured your brain to be another thing. And it's, you know, and as a director, you're trying to think like, okay, we've got coverage of this. Oh, wait, no, that was the other scene. Uh, what do we have of this? And you're just trying to figure it out. And it, uh, that was a big problem on Stillborn too, is you're just like, you're constantly just shooting in the same room for days. And you just, it's, it's insane. It, it makes you love leaving the house and going somewhere else. So this was an interesting thing. That pose right there, the death look there. Um, on the fourth day of shooting, we were shooting the bathtub sequence with Z, uh, which is later. And um, as I as we wrapped up that scene and we were moving on to the next part, uh, I walked out of the room and my I was wearing an Apple Watch and my my wrist vibrates, and I look at my wrist and it's just a photo of my grandpa who had just died. You know, minutes or an hour. I don't know how long it was. But my dad texted all of us, the siblings, a picture, his last picture right after he da died, because my dad got there shortly after he died. And it was just like a total, a total mess of just like, you know, we just finished this hugely, huge scene in the film, and I all of a sudden I've got this really bad news to deal with. And so um, it was just a, a tough fourth day of shooting. Um, and led to that sh the shot that my dad sent us to actually being used for when, because when we were shooting that uh, that shot of Deborah dead in bed, I pulled up the photo of my grandpa and I was like, let's do it like this. And it's if you know if you compare them, it's very similar. And it was kind of interesting to be able to to use that in the film. This was fun too, just because these we had these two. It's a very simple scene. They're just talking. It's kind of like their their grief hasn't fully hit yet. And it's it's like how do you how do you handle something like this? Um, uh, you know, because gr grief kind of hits in weird ways, especially if you don't have the greatest relationship with the person. So we had the joke, you know, uh, she looks the same but deader, and it was just kind of a, a throwaway thing. But on one take, it was, you know, three or four takes in, Sarah just started to laugh on it, and, and then Keegan starts laughing, and it just became this really cute 
moment where it's like, yeah, these, these two girls are so guarded from their relationship with their mom that it's totally not hitting them yet that, you know, how serious this situation is. And even though they don't have the best relationship with them, it's still, you know, it's, it's going to hit them eventually. And we as an audience kind of go like, man, they, 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 it's really just hits at home that they just do not like this girl, you know? Um, the scary toy thing. This is, this was a big kind of a key thing when, when we came up with the name Z, my wife and I, we, we wrote the first draft together and, uh, we kind of gave the name of the, the imaginary friend Z because it was kind of like a variable. It's like, Oh, what's his name? It's like, I don't know. We'll name him later. It's X, Y, Z, whatever. Um, and then Z kind of ended up sticking and immediately we started to talk about the alphabet games and just like things that kids would play with. And so we had this toy that would call out Z, Z, Z over and over. And uh, the script changed a bunch and, you know, but the the idea of this thing that could be used as a communicating device with Z uh, was born pretty much from the very first conversation about the idea of a kid and imaginary friend. In earlier drafts, it was more like, uh, it was more, um, uh, they had a younger son as well, so there was two kids, and it was his toy, so it was more present in the house, and then it started to reach out, but, uh, you know, once we got rid of the second son, and we moved it to just a single kid, um, it made sense to kind of have Beth explore her own childhood after the passing of her mom, and just sort of open up the floodgates of, of her past. This scene was super fun to shoot, just because you kind of just put... Um, Keegan in different spots in the kitchen and have her kind of riff on some ideas of being rejected from different parents and we ended up doing a pretty short version of it but there exists a longer cut of that where she's uh, you know she's really struggling to get people so this sequence here this is kind of the big one of the film Um, there was a scene that we had to cut for time when when they show up at the door there they did that walk up but they were supposed to, you know, show up at the door, and Josh is unwel- uh, unwelcome there, and it just extends the awkwardness, but it, it works the way it is. So uh, it was funny, when we when we found this house, this is actually the neighbor's house of the main house that we shot in, um, they they just allowed us to shoot there, and so when we went to scout, we, and in the script, we it was supposed to just have the kid land behind George, the mom, and just sort of a, a bag of bones, just boom, lands in the background, and this place had the two-story landing that just kind of went down from the top all the way to the bottom. And so it was kind of a discussion like, well, you know, how, how dangerous is this going to be? Because if you, if you go one story, um, it's going to hurt, but, you know, it's going to be nothing like this. <laughs> I need to protect my son. Boom! So it was fun. We, we wrapped the banister in a bunch of green bubble tape, and or bubble wrap, and we... We just had this dummy doll that was wearing the kids' clothes, and we just we threw him down normally a few times, and just had him go straight down, and it, and it was just way too fast. Like you, it just didn't feel right. It, it was super, just sort of blink and you miss it. And so we needed that big impact, so we started throwing it at the banister, and the sound that you hear is actually the sound of this mannequin, which is probably 30, 40 pounds, just smacking into that banister and falling to the ground, and it was just such a such a sickening thud and we didn't know when we did this and when we edited it we we knew it was cool but the response from it has been really interesting to watch as uh it just sort of became the calling card for the film like everyone kind of goes oh it's that's the moment where where things get real and that's you know it's just shocking because you just don't expect it you kind of tease it with the, the idea of him going up to play and georgia kind of being like oh he's na- taking a nap and then you kind of as their conversation gets more personal they, it just, you, you, you forget all about it. And so it really comes out of nowhere, even though it was pretty much set up and Georgia was right to be nervous. That's funny. He's sort of playing the whole, what happened at Daniel's house, throwing the kid. And again, those were shot on two different weeks. These back and forth, always fun. But, uh, yeah, just, uh, the, when we did our, our world premiere at Overlook, um, you could just hear it in the room that that it was kind of like oh we don't we didn't have money for test audiences or anything like that it was just basically a couple of the producers had seen the movie gave some notes and then you just kind of put it out there and that's that's what it is and so when we had that overlook screening um you could just hear the kind of the audible gasp that uh that 
that became just sort of this this mainstay of every festival that I went to where I would always pull out my phone at 26 minutes and I would start recording the crowd because every time it was just like no one's expecting it it's always really funny to see um originally here they they actually gave in, in the script they had basically said what was wrong you know they're like oh he's got a broken hip and blah 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 but then on the day when we were we were uh rehearsing it just felt right to keep it simpler and just more vague because the more we you know the more we try and give him a diagnosis um it, the you know it just sounded wrong and someone might be like well that's not you know that's not a real thing and you always run into that so you just keep it vague and keep it kind of uh uh just whatever it's he's hurt you don't want to know it's terrible obviously it's terrible we we heard it happen behind georgia it's it's not good it was always funny because we would have to have two sets of milk because Jet can only drink uh, almond milk. So we would have to, for for picture like this, we would film regular 2%, but then when we actually drink it and he pulls it up to his mouth, you can tell it's like this brown almond milk that is uh, just, you know, whatever he can drink. So this here, this drawing was done by Brittany Allen, who did the score for the film too. Um, we had a, a rough design of Z of what we were, nothing drawn or anything like that, but we had an idea. We were just like, Hey Britt, can you, can you draw something that's, you know, that we can use in the film for this big art on the wall? Because we couldn't do practical charcoal on the wall. You know, this, we didn't have the money to pay for a repaint or anything like that. So that's all CG, but we were basically like, we'll put tracking markers up and we'll figure it out later. She's reacting to something horrible. Um, but you know, I think it was day one or two, Britt had sent this drawing, that exact drawing, and it was just like this really weird and creepy thing, but I was just like, I, I, I think we need to dumb it down, because this is like an eight or nine year old boy, he's not going to be able to do something like this, and so, uh, you know, the idea was like, we'll take this idea, and we'll, we'll kind of iterate on it, and make it a little sloppier, and something that a kid couldn't draw, uh, but when we actually put it into the edit, it was just like, oh, it's so cool, and it kept getting such a great response, um, when we'd show off that scene. So we just said, there's this brown milk. Um, so we just said, all right, you know what, we're keeping it. If anyone says it's too detailed for a kid to draw, it's just like, as ah, he helped him draw it. Um, so it has come up a few times, but most people are just kind of like captured by how, how awesome that drawing is. No more plate for you, Z. So this is something interesting in editing when you're kind of from a storytelling perspective, uh, we went directly from, uh, I think it was actually the scene after she drugs him, she takes him over to the mom's house, which is the a scene in a couple scenes from now. Um, they, she basically drugs him and then you're seeing the effects as he's watching TV and he's just sort of staring, staring blankly at the TV. So in the edit, we, we made it so that he starts having reaction a little bit and they're noticing it. And then you have this whole scene was just sort of random footage we had from the film. Um, like that's a day for night shot. Uh, we had, this is just a, a shot of him almost asleep. That's basically just like five frames on repeat. And it's just creating this idea that he's just sort of up staring at Z all night, but it gives this, this kind of a weird foreboding feeling and going forward. And then, you know, you cut to him and it's, the next day, but this was actually supposed to be in the script anyways, the scene after she drugs him. Um, it just felt like it needed a little bit of pause there. And we're back to this house, which just photographs amazingly. It's got so much texture. Just like, look at those wallpapers and everything. And this cartoon was some public domain stuff, and that's uh, Avery Kentis and his brother Noah singing along, and I'm actually the, the, the fat female voice screaming uh, in there, but that was fun just to have them score the, the cartoons for us because, uh, you know, you, you, you need to have that childlike thing, but very, uh, aged and something maybe that Beth would have watched when she was a kid. But if you look at the cartoons and you watch what it is, it's got a train on tracks. And if you watch the film closely for it, there's pretty much trains everywhere. And like, uh, all over the film, there's trains trying to just sort of make you think trains all the time. So this is always fun to get into just a very, you know, you got your box of stuff, the box of plot. Every horror movie seems to have these. You need to give the audience some exposition based on something. 
So you have them stumble upon a box that has the plot in it. Stillborn has it. Z has it. Even Hereditary has it. You find something. It gives you all the information to set your character on a path uh, of where they need to go next. And so she finds this tape, which is going to lead her to the next part. Otherwise, you're just kind of stuck like, oh, she beat Z. It's it's over. It's great. He's drugged. It's fine. Um, so that's always fun. This was nice because we didn't have to do a comp on that screen. That's legitimately just TV snow. It's always nice to not have to do a screen comp on a screen. So from the very first, you know, uh, drafts of the, the script that my wife and I did, um, it was always going to be about Z wanting Beth back. And always there was always something, some reason she forgot it because of what happened with her father. Uh, when she was a little girl, like she, there was some deeply repressed memory that happened when she was a kid, and that's sort of what this is hinting at for the very first time. We we know up to this point that, um, you know, there's no real, no real love in their family, and we don't really know why. And this is kind of the first hint as to why is she starting to see these things from her past, and she's starting to remember a little bit. And so, this idea of Z being gone because of something horrible on her when she was, you know, eight or nine um, that caused her to repress this memory. Um, we start to really kind of hint at it there. But it was always kind of like what Z wanted. That was what changed later in, in later versions. So this is funny because the little girl here, the two-year-old, is actually Grace, my niece, who played Adam in Stillborn. So we had uh, her come out as a little kind of a nod to Stillborn. And uh, she got to play young Sarah Canning, which was great. And this girl here, um, we were able to get her uh, from Edmonton. And she it's she's just got this interesting look that kind of matches Keegan's look. Because Keegan has a very unique look. And it's always tough to cast kids for adults. But she just had very you know striking features like Keegan does. And it was kind of cool to be able to find someone that matched so well. This is always fun. The TV revelation, another horror movie staple. There's some editorial mishaps here with when she says Z. Try not to recognize it because uh, it's embarrassing to me as the editor. So when she cuts outside here, this was actually the very last scene of the first day of photography. But uh, if you look, you can see a bunch of paper uh, burning in the in the fire there because she initially throws paper in first all of his drawings and gets rid of everything Z related, but uh, as we simplified it in post, uh, it just became about the tape and you know she burns his stuff so Z burns her stuff, it's just kind of a tit for tat for them. So this scene up here when they're painting is really funny. Um, when it was written and when we even did it on the day, it was they're talking. I mean, if you think about what's happened, like you know, Josh is in trouble for throwing the kid off the banister. There, everything was so dark. But then they're having this conversation, like, "Hey, have you noticed anything wrong with Josh lately?" And it's like, obviously, there's you're staring at this giant charcoal drawing on the wall. Um, so it was definitely cut down just to to ma <laughs> to make it seem like it wasn't these totally aloof parents because we're too into it now to for them to be asking stupid questions like that. So thankfully we were able to just cut that down. So this was this is always fun to do puke gags. Um, learned a lot from it. It's uh, never smart to shoot green puke against a green screen. Um, I learned that, and uh, there's his brown milk again because that's a thing. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, this was pretty fun. It's, it's fun to just play around. This is definitely, like, something that you see being used more on, like, slasher films or things where you're doing a lot of blood and guts. But we just had a hose that was put where his mouth was. He would do takes of him kind of going, like, ugh, ugh, over and over and over. And then uh, we lined up an overlay on the monitor so we could put, position this hose uh, that was connected to a pump and, uh, you know, try and get it pretty close, and, and it works out fine. So when we're, this movie had like 185 scenes in it, which is absurd for a 90-minute movie. It's not even 90 minutes. Um, but this scene here, you know, it's a nice, it's the first time that we kind of live in a scene and let the parents talk, and, you know, it's very high energy, and 
it was the first time that we really got to spend our time just like filming these actors act. Like we, we shot a ton of coverage of the scene, but this whole, the mirror and their backs are to each other and stuff. It, it seemed to be the best way to show this scene off where you're kind of seeing the fronts and the backside of them because they're, they're kind of two faced here. At least she is. Um, so it's kind of fun to just let these actors just get really kind of heated. And just the mirrors are such a cool visual. It was just nice to be able to spend some time on a scene for once. Usually we spend like 30 minutes setting up and then you have like 10 minutes to shoot the entire scene and move on because you're shooting 12 to 13 scenes a day. But that one was, you know, we had an hour and a half to shoot that one scene and the lighting was simple enough that we could just kind of get a ton of coverage on it. There's probably so many different versions of that scene that exist in other universes. So yeah, we're back to the Ouija board scene as we called it. This toy, this was just always something that I knew had to be in here. Just like the idea of, you know, parents that watch this, they'll know the feeling of hearing a toy going off in the middle of the night. And usually it's for some weird gravitational reason where one toy fell onto another that was just sort of slipping over time or a battery malfunction or something like that. But I love the idea of, you know, there's nothing around this toy. It's just there in the middle of the room it's nothing's pressing it except for you know what if it's something just trying to reach out and communicate to you and it's just sort of now next time you know parent is up at night and they all of a sudden hear a toy going off they can't be sure that it's it's just some random force of nature that made it go it's uh it's um you know it's some imaginary being trying to to talk to them and that beth thing there that happened in ed in the edit too initially it was just z z z the whole way through but uh it was fun to to say a word there and uh it's it's much more impactful when you have her kind of stop like what did i just hear and then this is why we called it the ouija board thing because it was just spelling out a message for her and i love that when it sort of speeds up and the audience is kind of listening and they're going i am a g i n and you're just sort of spelling it spelling it spelling it and then you kind of realize what she's writing at the same time and she's writing imagine z and the way we had that done was that uh speak and spell thing was was programmed to cycle through that letter so it would just say imagine z imagine z over and over and over but it was really slow so uh, all of it is sped up in post so that it could sort of build up to this moment of release where she goes, imagine C. And now you're kind of like, okay, so it was nighttime a second ago. Now it's the middle of the morning. She's reading this, this thing, and then she goes and takes a bath, and then it's clearly nighttime again. So you have to wonder what she did for that entire day. But I'm sure it doesn't really matter. Candlelit scenes are always nice. You don't have to move big lights and stuff around. Just let the candles do it. And they were all double wicks, so they were really bright. It was nice. But this scene here was actually supposed to end a little bit differently as scripted. It was it was going to be, she's imagining, she's imagining, kind of the same build-up. But instead of the softer approach that we, we take here in a second, it was going to be like Z was going to launch out of the tub with just huge splash, big, huge, you know, huge jump stare, uh, scare stinger. And it was just going to be this kind of a, a huge moment. But when we were yeah, rehearsing it, it just seemed seemed kind of interesting if it was a lot more playful and um, and just sort of like cute and friendly. Because, um, I mean, if you think about it, this, this is a, a friend that is seeing his friend again for the first time in a while. So it's it's got this, there's this whole creepy vibe to it just being excited and it looking playful. I mean, this is the first time she's seeing it and it looks like a little kid. And there was a lot of variations of the VFX on his face there, because that's an actual guy. It's Luke Moore, who we had uh, play Z. But uh, there's a, actually, just stepping away, that, that blood there was a callback to the earlier scene where um, where Josh had the bloody nose because she saw, he saw Z for the first time, too. So that was kind of paying off something that doesn't actually exist anymore. But yeah, it's nighttime now, which uh, is uh, strange if you think about it, but whatever. Um but yeah, Luke Moore, he uh, he did a bunch of weird stuff. He can do a lot of kind of uh, weird poses and stuff. Very thin, thin, thin guy. And so we had a lot more like creepy, fast moving jerks and creaks in his neck and all this stuff. And it, it there was a lot of different versions of that that were going for scary, and it turned out to be actually scarier when he wasn't doing anything. It's more just like 
he's there. There's something there. It's a small splash. It's very creepy. And that, that turned out to be a big, you know, a big, a big moment for the film too, which was really fun. So this was actually a little bit different too. She, uh, initially goes, she started this scene in the basement. If later in the film, she does another Imagine Z sequence, uh, where she goes downstairs into the basement. Um, but it ended up being like three scenes after the first time she did it, where she did it in the tub and she returned to her house and she does it again. And it's kind of the same thing. And then it, she hears something upstairs when the tension builds and then she goes upstairs. Um, so these two scenes are actually totally disconnected from her, you know, her looking through all this stuff and her walking up the steps. It's, that's an edit there, a story edit. Um, cause we needed to, to use that basement scene later. This is fun. It was so fun shooting in that house. You just point a camera. It looks great. Everything's got a texture. Actually, this room in there, I, I didn't like that texture. It's kind of boring. It's a lot of blue. Blue on blue with some wood. But we got Sarah here crying. Got her big, big bottle of vodka. She's falling apart. She made those jokes earlier, but, you know, her mom's dead. It's not, it's, it's pretty serious. So you start to see the, the fracture in these, this family, how they're both dealing with the death. Always fun. It's great to get two great performers to just sort of do it. And the vodka with the label taken off because we don't have money to pay anyone for real labels or even prop labels. There's no money for stuff like that. And we definitely went through a lot of iterations of this, uh, of the, the carved in uh, the headboard, what it would say. Because we had, you know, Z plus Elizabeth, Z plus Beth. And, and the idea behind her name, Elizabeth, is that when she was a kid, she was called Elizabeth. And then when she got older, she dropped the Eliza and just was Beth for short. Uh, because she she no longer had Z in her life, and there's a Z in Elizabeth, um, so that it didn't work very good on the wood because you needed, you know, you needed just to stack the letters, and if it was like Z plus Elizabeth, it was just way too long. So that's a we screwed that up. Not really screwed it up, but you know. So this is this is kind of our sixth sentence sequence, where we were kind of worried about who the kid would be that we cast because if they were you know not particularly good um they could probably bungle something like this but look at the way he turned super dramatic jet was awesome so it was like had we known we had jet klein going into the film and writing the film we probably would have had a lot more creepy kid scenes where we could really kind of lean on him for stuff because you know jet he's super young but he's super experienced we got him Kind of like a fluke, actually. We we put out a Facebook posting just for general, you know, just fielding talent in and around Calgary. And someone, uh, a friend of Jet's mom, I guess, saw the posting and sent uh, sent it over to them. So he she sent us our, his headshot, and he was the, literally the very first kid that we even saw in the film. And this was the day that we posted just an initial like, hey, send you know send us your stuff. Let us let us sort of see what's out there to see if you know potentially we can fill some roles, which we did. But um, we got his headshot, and you know you look at the back of it, and it's like, holy crap, this kid's been in like skyscraper. He's the he was in the boys, the boy in the boy, um, and it was just like, who is this kid? And so we had him read, and we, it was just like, I think we have our kid already, and that's incredibly rare when you're when you're going in a movie like this you're you're terrified of who is going to be the who's going to be the kid like who are you going to get to play this kid because the movie kind of relies on him for the first half to really kind of anchor z and so we had you know we cast jet pretty much immediately and it was just total fluke just a random facebook posting that 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 stayed um we got lucky with all the kids um like the the young girl uh, the young beth she she was great we we shot her stuff uh later on too a couple months after production i went back to calgary and shot and uh and yeah it was uh she was great so um yeah with jet it was just like 
you know, we had a kid who knew the ropes of being on set, could take a note, and it was uh, a lot of fun to just let him, to let him come on set and not be the kid actor, but just be the kid. So yeah, we picked up this stuff later on, and we shot it on an old mini DV camera in my parents' basement, uh, and it was uh, it was fun. It's definitely a nod to the ring, and it's funny to look at the screen because you know it's obviously a screen comp, but this old doctor still using Windows 98 or 95, whichever it is, and doesn't even play the screen, the video full screen. He's just uh, whatever the the standard res. It was probably like 320 by 240 or something like that. He's just playing it on the screen for her. <laughs> I always think that's funny. Totally empty desktop. It's such an old man. Look at that. Nothing there. There's my documents, and that's it. The reason for that is because... I did the VFX, and I didn't want to put in more work than I had to. Just, uh, it's not a big VFX shot, so don't spend too much time on it. This is a much nicer VFX shot. That whole background is replacement. So that was nice. So this was something interesting. It's kind of a cinematic thing. So she's calling her husband here, and then you cut, and you're going back in time a little bit because he's working, and the it's either a long time for that phone to connect, or... It's just a very cinematic thing to do. You're kind of uh, jumping back in time a little bit. But it was something that was brought up a couple times. Like, well, why did it take that long for the phone to call? I don't know. I don't write the rules. It just is. So this whole sequence here was kind of heavily inspired by a sequence in uh, Orphan, where she's in the hospital and she's realizing who the orphan really is. Spoiler alert. And... Uh, Peter Sarsgaard is alone at home with the orphan, and she needs to get home and save his life before it's too late. And they had a much bigger budget, so they could do a lot more interesting, crazy car stuff, because our stunt here, which is coming up, where you have the three t cars almost collide, is just Kurt Harder, the producer, driving three different cars back to back to back as the camera was locked off, and he's driving all three of them. And that was done a day or two after production, before I went back home. So this, th these scenes always kill me. It's like, you're giving it's so obvious what's about <laughs> what's about to happen here. The dad's got the perfect dad moment, so clearly, you know, he's about to die. And of course, you know, in the last take as Sean left the room, he said, "I'll see you tomorrow." It's so obvious. Back to the speeding car. That's me holding the camera outside of the trunk of a car in front. And then we have this VFX, three different cars weaving past each other. Oh, it's a close call. That's CRX is mine, by the way. And, uh, yeah, it's a classic, uh, classic scene here coming up. Now, this is something that is, uh, is tough. So, we had this scheduled at the very end of the day. And this is a big sequence. <clears throat> it's a huge sequence with a lot of moving parts. There's lighting effects, there's makeup effects, because we had Z on the day, and he was supposed to come off the wall practically and doing all this stuff, but... They just never really got the time or attention that it deserved. So all the lead-up stuff is great. It's fine. I had to do some VFX tricks to make it look like uh, to make it look like we had a wide shot of this because uh, this was shot differently than it appears right now. A lot of this stuff is created from different assets, from different scenes because it just didn't work the way that we shot it. We spent so much time on the on set and ran into overtime because it just nothing worked here. It was this is all people with their their iPhones and they're they're putting gels in front of their light their iPhones and just basically like clapping their lights to create the simulated effects we just didn't have the right stuff to go so we actually had we shot footage of Z coming off the wall and like he was in this like Jesus pose and then he he was on a dolly so he's like gliding towards him and it just no, it was just way too much. It felt like an alien movie where you had these lights going and stuff. So this was the very last scene that we locked before before we, we finished. And, and it's been a, a scene that has been probably picked on the most by people. Luckily, the pizza scene is kind of forgotten. But it, it turned into a thing where we were just kind of playing with what, how much do we show. And then it leads to this. And this, you know, this is the big VFX sequence that was written after seeing a tutorial on how to do VFX on uh, a website that that sells VFX assets. And so I was kind of tasked with making a house on fire, which is not something I had ever done before. So this is a lot of me figuring out what to do. But um, 
going back to talking about this day, this was the 10th day of production, the last day in this house. We had the whole afternoon to film this fire sequence, which is a, obviously a massive scene because it's kind of the climax before you go into the third act. Um, but as we, we were lighting, it took, you know, it's a big lighting setup, probably an hour and a half. We had a bunch of big stuff. We had a condor with a big light on it that would flicker and lights in the house that would flicker. But as we got it all set up, the generator that we had, the big tow jenny, it uh, ran out of gas. And so we had to send, I don't know who we sent, it was a PA or one of the grips or something. They had to go into town, but it was like 2 a.m. And uh, the the nearest, uh, we were out in Pritis, Alberta, the nearest gas station had been closed for a long time. So they had to go deeper into the city, which was a solid hour away. And they had to get gas there and drive all the way back. So in the end, this whole sequence that we had, we had maybe an hour and a half to shoot it. And, you know, it's such a huge sequence that we just weren't able to shoot as much as we needed to. And so it's, um, you know, it's it's fine. It does what it needs to do. But it's um, it's missing some of the coverage that we were trying to, to get there. It's always unfortunate. So this, this whole thing here is just like, here's Alberta. Um, in this the original script, it was supposed to be like an urban downtown setting, and the only trains that really go downtown Calgary are like the, the C train, the um, it's like a subway kind of thing, above ground subway. And um, it uh, you just can't get control over that. And it's not very cinematic to have a, that, that kind of a train anyway. So we ended up having to look outside of the city, and we found this this great patch. Uh, it's like a 27 kilometer track, uh, that, uh, this single owner owns and he does like a polar express in the winter and stuff like that. But he owns this entire track around this area that he, he does parties on and stuff like that. So we were able to, to rent it for a couple of hours and, and it was a lot of fun to control a train. But we had this, this big day. It was a train day. It was the hottest day of the year. It was like 40 degrees Celsius, which, um, which is crazy. And, uh, we had to shoot, you know, a ton of stuff with a train and then all the stuff with, with Jenna looking for the boy and all that stuff. And so uh, it was kind of interesting, too, because this is the first time that we shot Keegan out for the day and then she just got to go home and uh, just not be there for the rest of the day. So she has no idea what we shot with the train. It was kind of interesting for this big, big sequence for her character not to be a part of it all. Um, so this here, when she walks in and the door closes on her, this was the initial ending to the scene. It cuts to black, goes forward. That was in the first, uh, the first edit. It cut, you know, jumps forward in time, but it just felt like it was missing something to kind of launch you into a future time. And so we took the scene late, uh, earlier that we we cut out of the film where she goes into the basement. And if you look at what she's wearing right now, she's wearing this pink sweater vest and a gray T-shirt. And so when she goes inside the house and she goes into the basement, all of a sudden she's wearing just a striped t-shirt. And uh, just to match continuity a little bit, I had to track some dirt onto her face whenever you see it, just to make it look like she's still a little dirty. But, I mean, I guess you just assume she changed her clothing because she's in something totally different right now. But that's the power of editing. No one really cares about her shirt. You just let her actions kind of tell the story, and we needed something bigger to, to launch us forward in time as we kind of take this indeterminate amount of t uh, time forward for the story so that, you know, she's been living with Z for, for however long. This was fun to shoot because it's, you know, one lighting. You don't, The actor's not moving, so you're able to get a lot of interesting coverage. And so it was, it was another situation where you just have more time than you need to get a scene, so you're just like, oh, what else can we do? And uh, I think it probably would have worked better without seeing eyes here. It's one of those things where you do it, you don't do it, and it just, I don't know, it just ends up being what it is. But we added eyes. So when my wife and I wrote the first draft of the script, it was... Um, it kind of ended when Kevin died and the house went up in uh, flames and it was it was a big sequence of, uh, you know, the, everything kind of ended there. The husband died, etc. And that was the end. And there wasn't really a reason for Z or anything like that. It was just missing that big kind of story chunk of what, what was Z going for? What was Z after? And so when Colin Minahan and I went into the second and third and blah, blah, blah drafts, that was kind of the biggest question for us was like, what 
do we do with Z? Like, what does he want? We know he wants Beth, but why? And so it was a lot of experimenting, a lot of talking back and forth and trying to figure out, like, what what does he want? Because that's what the whole thing is. Like, uh, if it can't just be coming after for no reason. Um, and so we, you know, we played with a bunch of different ideas, and then it was kind of like, oh, okay, we've got this interesting idea where it's, um, it, it, you know, when she was a kid, she made this promise to marry and him and have babies and and it it stuck with him and it, and she forgot all about it and so he's been waiting in the dark for her to remember him again and once she had a kid she was able to um it was able to use him like the doctor says to to get you know to get back at her and so as this whole third act thing came together pretty quickly once we figured that out like what if z wins and what if she has to move in with him and it and it makes a total sense now but when we were trying to come up with it, it was so challenging to try and figure out how how to make that work. But it was a, a ton of fun to shoot. This was the last week of production. And uh, other than a couple of sequences, like when we had Deborah in to play the mom, um, everything was basically just us and Keegan. And so, it, it you know, it was nice to push everything like that to the end of the film once Keegan had kind of found herself... Um, in in Beth and just sort of figured out the character more because you know this is asking a ton of an actor to be this vulnerable and to be this crazy and just sort of to trust the process here especially this scene here where she's sitting across from Z or an empty space uh, you know as a filmmaker it was really fun because you're kind of just pointing a camera into a space you're 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 you know you shoot coverage of Keegan then you turn the camera around and point it at an empty chair and you, you're just kind of like looking at it like I uh, I think he's a bit taller. Let's tilt up a little bit more. Um, okay, that's good there. And uh, it's it's it was just really funny where it's like quiet on set, everybody, and action, and you're just watching nothing on the monitor. There's just an empty space. But you're you know you're trying to cross cut a sequence where there's one actor playing off nothing, and it was really fun. And we did it here. And then there's another scene that we actually cut out of the film later. Um, that uh, it's in the deleted scenes. But it was kind of the same thing where there you're you're giving so much power in the frame to this thing that isn't there, and it was just kind of a lot of fun to experiment with that and put Keegan through that because she's, you know, she's acting like this battered housewife to something that's not there, and just to get there mentally, it's it was really fun to watch. And she just had four straight days to just sort of be in this horrible makeup, be in this uncomfortable, childish, you know, pajamas, and just you know, living in filth for a little while. Those eggs actually look really good. But this was, this was just total, ton of fun to do. And it's just, it's just weird. And it moves really fast, so it's really nice. But again, you watch here, here's the cartoons. And oh, there's a train on fire. There's, there's a train. It's all about trains. And there's more of me and Noah and Avery singing and doing all these voices. There's me. I was playing the fat one on the tracks. So that was fun. There's a train. Lots of train stuff. So this was a situation, too, where we shot just Stephen McCaddy and her coverage of the scene. And then uh, this, this part here was done in the fourth week when she was alone. So it's always interesting for continuity and things like that for them to match up. And you don't really notice the differences, the micro differences and like makeup and stuff like that. It all plays fine, but this was in the third week, and then the rest of the stuff without the doctor was in the fourth week, and uh, yeah, it was really fun. Keegan was in such a weird place. This is one of my favorite scenes in the film. Just we've got his face on screen, which looks great. Keegan's got this horrible makeup on, and she looks so crazy. And you're you're in this house that just photographs great. This is the same house as Stillborn again. So this this is basically the same sequences. Mary coming and asking to to talk to Jane, the old lady. This shot always re reminded me of True Detective for some reason. Who are you watching cartoons with? Sorry. This is funny. Just look at all this random knickknacks in this house. It's so crazy. 
park him in front of a in Z's chair, and once again they're sitting in Z's chair, and he doesn't like that. And that's the idea there that that's the head of the table. That's where that's where Z sits. Look at Keegan. She looks like a mess. When we started making this film, one of the things I told her from the beginning, I was just I sent her pictures of Tony Collette in Hereditary, and I'm just like, you know, the big the big close up of her face when she's just terrified, and and I was just like, don't be afraid to be you know to be ugly, don't be afraid to just like show your show wrinkles and be kind of, you know, you're you're used to looking so pretty. Don't be afraid to, to let, you know, just to be really kind of gross looking because it's going to, you know, she's in her worst part of her life here. And it's uh, it's fun to watch her uh, to just sort of fall apart like this. And, and uh, you know, she really went there for it, which was so much fun just to, to let her kind of play in this this horrible situation with, with, with herself pretty much because she's just alone. But it was fun. We kind of got locked into a good situation here where she was able to to really just sort of find it and be in this dark place and and just sort of, you know, live there. And we got to, to do a lot of stuff. Ah, oh, Keegan. It was definitely a situation where you get a few takes out of it and then the well is run dry. You definitely push... We were definitely pushing her to the point of exha exhaustion where she's kind of scene to scene to scene is just always just like, okay, you're devastated. You're crying. It's such a mess for you. Oh, you're dealing with the worst thing in the world. And she had to just kind of keep pull <laughs> pulling this, these things out over and over. I can't even imagine. That's why I don't act. Just having to cry endlessly. And it's just funny when you talk to her, she goes, I would always think, like, I wouldn't be crying here. And, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm stronger than this. I wouldn't cry. But then she would get into the scene and, and then she would just start crying because she's she's just finding this thing inside of her and just totally being a, this abused thing. And uh, it, was, it was so much fun to film. This was funny because we had, like, four pieces of wood that we could use. So we just kept repeating them. It's just the same pieces of wood. We had one thing on the left, you can see. We just sort of moved that around as needed. It was just one solid piece. Because we couldn't actually drill any holes into this house. This house is super old. This was nice because it's actually a practical shot. Put some photos that we took. Like we took those family photos at uh, my aunt's house when we were shooting the scene. Uh, and just it's just an iPhone shooting a thing and it, it worked great. So this is a scene that a lot of people have talked about, and they've they they kind of go, is, is he having sex with her? And I can confirm that no, he is not, because I don't think Z knows what sex is. I think to Z and her eight-year-old brain, when they they sort of made these rules, there was probably just heavy cuddling. So I think what what the intention is is that he's breathing here, but it does kind of look like a thrust or two. But it's not supposed to be. He's just big and breathing. So those are just inhales and exhales. No big deal. This was not my iPhone. That was my iPhone in the last scene. This was not mine. We just had a prop Android phone. We were okay with doing that. That was fine. I remember shooting this and afterwards realizing that I crossed the axis. And uh, I felt like I was devastated, but it's fine. Just weren't able to shoot as much, show as much of the, the shot as we wanted to. But that, that wood behind her there is the same wood that was in the front windows. It was just one solid piece that we were able to move around. So she's barricaded in completely. Now she has no link to the outside. All our photos are gone. But she's still able to make breakfast for him. That's great. This was funny because it wasn't a, a scheduled scene or anything. They were, the DP was working on the TV because there was a scene that was deleted where she, Z's watching cartoons by himself at night and, and Beth wants to go to bed. Um, and uh, I just said, hey, come over here, look out the window, this is great, and just rolled on some shots on that and was able to use in the film. So when we initially shot the film, we actually had a different actor playing the dad. Um, we did the whole Photoshop with him with the mom, because that's actually Deborah when she was young. She gave us this photo, and we Photoshopped in the, the father character, but we had a different guy in the, in the role, and 
he was great. It was all it all worked fine, but the problem was he looked exactly he was bald and he looked like the cancerous mom. So people thought the mom was hanging here. And uh, unfortunately, that's more confusing than what we wanted to to do. So we uh we had to recast him. And when I went back to shoot the young Sarah Munn was her name, the young Beth, um we reshot all of the stuff with the dad as well. So the home videos we shot with him there and uh, him hanging and I had to kind of replace the other guy with the new dad, who was totally different. He had a mustache, all this stuff. But just a very different looking guy, so you can tell that it's a, someone different. That, that was unfortunate, because uh, it was through no fault of the, the actor. And we're getting into some pretty weird stuff now. The wedding the wedding with Z, I guess it's the fulfilling the, the promise of a child, their, their childhood friendship. But Z uh, pulls out all the stops. That's a lot of rose petals. That's really nice. And we had this really nice dress that fit Keegan perfectly. It was very, very pretty. And then you put her in this situation, and it's just very sad. Look at that dress. That train is crazy. So this footage on the TV, there was a lot of different vari versions of what was going to be on the TV. Initially, it was going to be like um, bride, uh, the Bride of Frankenstein, I think. And that was the idea where it was going to be like a monster marrying uh, whatever, like, you know, marrying a monster type of thing. That was the original idea that was scripted. But I couldn't actually find anything about that and, and you know, rights and issues and stuff like that. And so later on, it turned into footage of her saying, oh, when I get older, we're going to get married and have lots of babies. But then we that didn't work either. So I found some old home videos from a wedding that my grandparents had shot back in like the early 80s. And I digitized it and just threw it in there. And I, I acted as the officiant there. So that's my voice saying you you may, may now pronounce you man and wife. And it's supposed to be like the mom and dad. Um, so this is our, our low budget return to the... The, uh, the floor is lava game, where if we were going to do the other version, you would have had some, you know, spectacular VFX there on the floor as everything is, uh, you know, bubbling around her hot magma. That shot of her throwing the pillow took a lot of takes, but that was done on, you know, it took a while. And the idea behind it doesn't even work out as much as I had hoped, so it is what it is. This is so strange. Z throwing a hissy fit. What a crazy movie. So this is another thing that changed in the edit. When we had Josh ADR his lines, it was uh, just very... It was kind of sad to make him mad at her still. Even though she did all this stuff for him, it ended up being like, you stole my friend, and then just hangs up on her, and it's kind of kind of guts you. It's very sad. And then it's like, oh, great, all the pillows are, are moved. So, Or we've got pillows here now, so that means in the rules of... I wish I'd shot that from a higher angle. But um, in the rules that we have here, we know that he could have come down because there was no block you know, for him to... He was able to walk down there because the floor was lava. So it was nice. So we had a deleted scene in between these two that were, were kind of interesting. Um Z was watching cartoons. It was like the big chair sitting in front of the TV and she's standing in the background like a battered housewife as she's just, you know, like, oh, I'm going to go up to bed. I'm feeling kind of tired. And she's very guilty about what happened. But we just cut it down to being one day and just kept the, the momentum going. And then we're back to Josh playing with her and we're checking in on them. I think she's still wearing the same shirt, actually. That's kind of funny because it's been weeks. Maybe she just changed back into that shirt i'm not sure but we we got the classic reveal of oh he's gone and in his place it's just this perfectly placed ray of light so this always bugs me because there's this part where she looks through the, the door and it's it's kind of tough to see what she's seeing through um it really needed a shot over her shoulder seeing the door because it's kind of like i don't know if you can really tell what that is but it's fine this is so weird. 40 degrees. She's. It was just nightmarishly hot out here. And, uh, you know, there's no real shade when you're out there. It's just sun everywhere. So that was fun. So 
So this uh, the the cop there in the front that's Blaine, Blaine Schlechter. He's uh, he was also a cop in Stillborn when uh, the glass breaks in the the nursery and there's cops that come to investigate. He didn't have any lines, but um, it, we joke that this is the Blaine universe because he's a cop in both and he's kind of holding these these uh, films together. It's it's kind of just his the stuff he's been working on and he's kind of this background figure in the in the films and that's always really funny. So this is fun because, uh, you know, you got a kid on the tracks and we were able to control a train for two solid hours. And we had no idea going into this day. Um, it was Chris Ball and I, one of the co-producers, who was, uh, you know, in charge of all the train-related stuff. But uh, we knew we had two hours because we could only afford two hours with this train. And we didn't know how many passes of a train we'd be able to get. So it's like we can do... You know, we were, we kind of scheduled for four, I believe, where we had all these different cameras. I think we had three cameras running on this part, and we had four cameras running uh, on some of the B-roll. But uh, we just didn't know how many how many shots we'd be able to get, and and it turned out we could actually get a lot. So the train just drives forward, catches the speed, and then it stops pretty quickly, and then it just backs up and does it again. So we were able to, you know, I think we got at least like twelve different runs, and we just kind of kept filming it and kept filming it, and we got a lot more options than than we initially anticipated. But it was fun. The it was uh just interesting to have that much power because those things they don't they don't look like they're moving that fast but when you're close up like this and you just see their their weight it's unbelievable how dangerous these things are i mean i've seen final destination where you know something can be on the tracks and get knocked up and cut your head off that's terrifying so this was the last sequence shot with mccaddy and the cops and uh, it was fun to have all that go down but a uh, nice little crossfade slow motion sequence like a music video. The confused face. What is he walking into? And this music was so good. This this family theme here that Brittany did, it was um it was kind of a situation where we in our temp music we used the family theme from uh, the Haunting of Hill House by Mike Flanagan that the Newton Brothers did, and uh, it's so such so much emotion and so much kind of horror at the same time that we really wanted to capture. And I think Britt did such a great job with this family theme and just kind of revisiting it. And it's very sad and and lonely, and it's uh, you know it's pretty devastating. That that rope is all CG because uh, she had a huge harness around her there. That was not fun to do. I have heard that some people think that the movie should have ended right here. I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I feel like this works fine. The The whole idea, basically, that the cops were able to save her before she died, and she had, uh, like, anoxia of the brain, and she, you know, lost oxygen to the brain. So, um, you know, that her she sacrificed basically her imagination and her brain to save her son and her father, you know, it has the parallels with her father who hanged himself and, uh, he killed himself and, you know, Z didn't go anywhere. Just the trauma of it just delayed the inevitable. So I don't know if Z is going to be locked up inside of her. Maybe she's doing this battle with Z. I don't know. It's kind of interesting, but it's nice to sort of see Sarah take the motherly role here and take care of her sister after her sister had taken care of her. It's kind of the power of trauma and grief. You never know what's going to shake loose out of it and what your story is going to be because, you know, the, uh, the amount of power you can find in yourself when something horrible happens, a tragedy befalls your family, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It never goes the way you expect it to. You always kind of think like, oh, I could never do that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can because, you know, you, you have to. And that's kind of what we're dealing with here. We've got this situation that's so terrible um, that it's hard to really wrap your head around unless you're living it. And when you're living it, it just becomes the new normal for you. And it's really sad and lonely. But, you know, as Josh says, his final good nights here, you can kind of think like, oh, well, it's sequel bait because you're setting up, oh, you know, good night, Z. It's, it's, uh, it obviously means Z's still around, but 
you know, Josh says goodnight to dad. And earlier in the film, after the, the gerbil or the, the hedgehog dies, he says goodnight, Chewy. So just because he's saying goodnight doesn't mean it's actually gone and could be inside of the mom there still, just sort of trapped inside her broken, her broken brain. But uh, we had two different versions of this ending, one where this is the more on the nose version. Um, and we actually had an alternate here where there was going to be eyes glowing above him as just kind of like the final, like, ah, boogie, boogie. But that didn't happen. Uh, the other version was she he asked for the, the door to be closed at the very end, and then she closed the door because he likes it dark. But I like, I like this ending better. And that was Z. My son Sawyer did all the titles here. He did all the titles at the beginning of the film, too. That's the nice thing about having kids is when you make a kid movie and you can't figure out a font that you want to use, uh, you just get your kid to write them out. And I promised him a video game, and it cost me a lot less than had I paid, you know, professional. So people with kids, they, you know, it's possible to get, to get uh, cheap labor out of them. So it's something to think about. And here we have all the fine folks that uh, allow these things to happen. The people that put in money, put in time, did all the things that this movie wouldn't exist without. And it's, uh, you know, it's fun to to do this. These these films are, you know, they're hard to make, especially on this this kind of a budget. You're you're bringing all these different people together, who you know, they want to they wanna be there. They're not just there for the money because, let's face it, there isn't really any money <laughs> to make. No one's getting rich off this stuff. So it's it becomes more about, um, more about just the experience and building, you know, building friendships and, and, and everything. So all these people that come out, um, you know, a lot of them are giving their time for free and a lot of them are just working for very low salaries and stuff like that. And it's just... Uh, you know, it's awesome to sort of build those relationships because, you know, the best thing in the world is when you wrap a film and you, you, you get that last shot and you just are able to just kind of look around at everyone and just say, wow, we did it. You know, like what an undertaking. We went to battle for four weeks and we came on the other side um, with this product that, you know, hopefully is going to scare people around the world. And, uh, you know, it's hard. It, it's such a short period of time in the, in the lifetime of the film that it's uh, you know four weeks out of the two years that it took to take this to make this film, and uh, when you you know those relationships that you make during that during that process, uh, it's such a short time, but it it's just it, they are kind of like forever, and it's it's really kind of cool to to have that just to to be proud of everybody that came out of this film and to to really just sort of know that in ten years I could run out to. You know, I could go to Calgary and see one of these people on the streets and greet them with a big fat hug and just, you know, know without saying just sort of how tight that relationship is because of this experience. So um, I'll leave the, the final moment of text here in a second to have its own silent thing. But this was Brandon Christensen doing my very first commentary. A lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, thanks for watching.